What's up you guys, Rafe Tarazi here, and last week I posted a video of my recent HIV doctor's uh, visit. It's my six month follow-up visit that I do, and I get my lab work done, talk to my doctor, Jake Gladstein, ask any questions, he'll let me know of any new updates or anything that I should know about. And uh, yeah, it's pretty easy, seamless, as you guys saw, for those of you who saw it. And uh, I decided I wanted to do something this time that I've never done before, which is actually go into my lab results, my blood work results and my urinalysis. So I think that would be really interesting and we can just break it down and kind of see what the results were. And, and also I announced in January that I had switched from my previous HIV medication, which was Genvoya, to the new one, Bictarvi. And so I've been taking Bictarvi since January and this is the first time that I'm getting lab results which kind of show me how my body's doing and how I took to the medicine. Aside from what's shown in lab work, um, there have been no side effects. I love it, it's great, it's one pill once a day. It doesn't matter if I take it with food or drink, it doesn't matter when I take it, and I don't have any side effects, so here we go. Oh, also, don't mind the apartment. This is my new home where I just moved. I'm super excited about it, but as you can see, pretty empty at the moment, I don't have any, um, I don't have any furniture for the living room, so it's literally just empty. <laughs> and so I'm gonna be working on that slowly. I know I haven't shown you guys the apartment yet. I'm gonna do a little apartment tour so you guys can at least see my new digs. And I'll probably have that posted, I'm gonna say next week at the latest. So stay tuned for that. Without further ado, here is my labs. So, I'm kind of breaking it down into categories as it's as it's presented to me. Um, and these are the categories that I'm gonna go through. And it's in order as it was listed for me on the website with uh, the CD4 and the viral load being listed at the very end. So I'm just going in order through each category. We're gonna start with the lipid panel and then do the CMP, which is the comprehensive metabolic panel. Then we're going to the CBC, which is the complete blood count. Then onto the complete urinalysis. Then we're doing the FTA ABS, which is a fluorescent treponemal, I don't know if I'm saying that right, antibody absorption. Then we're doing the hemoglobin A1C, then the TSH, then the lymphocyte subset panel five, and then last but not least, the HIV-1 RNA quantitative real-time PCR. If you don't know what 90% of that means, that's okay, don't worry. Um, I'll sort of explain things as we go along if it's necessary. If not, eh, it's whatever. I'll cover the important stuff and, and, and explain that. Okay, so here we go, starting with the lipid panel. Lipids being another word for fat. This is gonna be testing cholesterol and triglycerides. So my HDL cholesterol, which is good cholesterol, was 61 and the ideal range is greater than 40 milligrams per deciliter. So I definitely am in that range. Good cholesterol, doing great. Triglycerides, uh, 44. Ideal range is less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Definitely in that as well. And triglycerides is like how much fat is in the blood. Um, the LDL cholesterol, typically known as bad cholesterol, um, was 131. Optimal is actually less than 100, so not optimal. 100 to 129 is okay, and I'm at 131, which is just outside of that range, which means I'm in the borderline high range. That's unusual for me. I usually don't have an, an issue at all with cholesterol, so I'm wondering if the fact that I had that Chips Ahoy uh, chocolate chip cookies right before my blood test is skewing my results here. So I'm not gonna worry too much about that. It's just slightly in the borderline high range, and considering the fact that I had some chocolate chip cookies, not, my, not, not the best move on my part, but considering that I did that right before my uh, blood test, I'm gonna assume that it's probably skewed. If not, my diet's doing great, I'm exercising a lot, and I don't foresee that being a potential problem in the next six months. Okay, on to the next category, the CMP, which is the Comprehensive Metabolic Panel. Starting with glucose, <laughs> it's at 112, which is high. The ideal range is 65 to 99, and I'm at 112. So again, probably skewed by the fact that I had a bunch of sugary, fatty, delicious chocolate chip cookies right before my blood test. Um, so I'm not gonna worry about that either. That's usually not an issue. Um, glucose is usually not an issue for me either. So I have a feeling that I was skewed by some cookies. Worth it. Maybe, I don't know. 
Um, urea nitrogen is a marker for liver and kidney function. Mine was 19. Ideal between 7 to 25 milligrams per deciliter. Creatinine is also a marker for kidney function. So I want to talk about creatinine for a second because a lot of you are concerned about taking creatine because of the potential for it to raise your creatinine levels, which raised creatinine levels is used kind of as a marker to determine whether you have kidney issues. But creatine can cause your creatinine levels to go up, which would be a false indicator of kidney issues. It's, it's, it's two separate things. So that's why if you have seen one of my um, doctor's appointment videos in the past, my doctor, Jay Gladstein, actually talks about that specifically and how the creatine is safe and um, it's fine. It's not going to harm your kidneys, but it has that potential to, re to raise that creatinine marker, giving the impression that you have some um, issues with your kidney, even if you don't. Now, the only time where it might be um, more of a consideration, more, more of an issue, something you have to discuss with your doctor is you, if you already have underlying kidney issues. If not, my doctor's like, don't worry about it, Cre creatine's fine. And just to let you know, I take creatine every single day and have been doing it for years and years. And my creatinine level is at 1.17 and the desired range is between 0.6 and 1.35. So I'm in that, that good range. There's, there's no issues there for me. Okay, moving on to EGFR. Um, that's the estimated glomerul estimated glomerular glomerular glom glomerular Glo I don't know estimated glomerular filtration rate and that's what I'm gonna go with. Uh, Becca, can you tell me how that's pronounced? Cause I don't know. Maybe she'll probably let me know in the comments. <laughs> when it comes to like scientific stuff, Becca is really knowledgeable and she's a longtime friend of mine, basically like family, and she usually um will correct me in the um, YouTube comments after I post my video. So, let me know, Bex. Uh, it's also a marker for kidney function. So, mine was at 81. Desired is greater or equal to 60 milliliters per, per minute per 1.73 M something to, I don't know what that means, but it's in the right range, so. <laughs> uh, then we've got sodium, 140. Optimal range between 135 and 146, so I'm right in the middle. And that is millimoles per liter. What is a millimole, you ask? I have no idea. But I presume it's uh, not a mole, it's smaller than a mole, and it's smaller than a mole by a thousand because of the milli. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I'm assuming because that's what it means, uh, and it sounds right, so I'm gonna go with it. Millimole, love it. Again, Becca, millimole, if you wanna explain that, great, cool. Because, uh, yeah, that's my that's my best educated guess. Then we have um, potassium. 4.1 was the result. We want it between 3.5 and 5.3. Again, millimoles per liter. And um, potassium is an electrolyte. It's also an indicator for kidney disease, high blood pressure, and heart disease. Then we got chloride, 105. We want it between 9, 98 and 110 millimoles. It's also an electrolyte and indicator for kidney disease. You're gonna notice that a lot of these coming up now are all indicators for kidney disease. They might be indicators for other things as well, but predominantly we're looking at kidney and liver function with all of these. So um, I'm not gonna go into each one, but I'll, I'll let you know how, what the results were for each. Carbon dioxide, the measure of CO2, CO2 in my blood, make sure that's okay. That was a 24, needs to be between 20 and 32. Calcium, 9.7, needs to be between 8.6 and 10.3. Protein total, 7.3, needs to be between 6.1 and 8.1. Albumin is 4.6, needs to be between 3.6 and 5.1. Globulin uh, was 2.7, needs to be between 1.9 and 3.7. The albumin and globulin ratio was 1.7, it should be between 1 and 2.5. Bilirubin, bil bilirubin, bil... bil Bilirubin, total 0.6, should be between 0.2 and 1.2. That's an indicator for liver function. Um, alkaline phosphatase, 64, between needs to be between 40 and 115. And this is units per liter. What is a unit, I ask? I don't know. All the other units are specific, like deciliter or millimole, or that's, that's the unit. This one just says unit per liter. What? Unit! How come it doesn't specify the unit? Why are we so ambiguous all of a sudden? I don't get it. Becca, explain. Anyway, that's an indicator for liver 
gallbladder or bones. Um, AST, which is aspartate aminotransferase, 36 should be between 10 and 40 units per liter. And then we have ALT, alanine transaminase, which was 30, and it should be between nine and 46. Moving on to the next category, this is our complete blood count, CBC. I'm not going to the specifics of each of these either because they're general indicators for our body's health. It's just good to know that everything is in the right range that it should be at. Basically at this point, my results are so good that I'm just gonna say what they were testing for, what the result was, and if I don't say anything else, then you can know that it was in the proper range. So we have the white blood cell count, which was 4.2, red blood cell count, 5.21, hemoglobin, 14.5, Hematocrit, 14.2 MCV, which is the mean corpuscular volume, which I looked up, is the size of red blood cells. That's interesting that they measure the size of your blood cells. And that was at 81. Um, the desired range is 80 to 100, so it's on the low end. So that means I have smaller red blood cells. Interesting, right? Like. Who knew? MCH was mean corpuscular hemoglobin, don't ask, um, 27.8. MCHC, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, 34.4. Uh, red cell distribution width, 13. Platelet count, 299. MPV, mean platelet volume, 10.1. All of these are in the right range, right where they need to be, so my complete blood count is looking great. On to the next category. Uh, we have the complete urinalysis which is, as you guessed it, an analysis of my urine. Color, yellow, should be yellow. Appearance, clear, should be clear. Uh, specific gravity, 1.029 in the good range, and then my pH was six. We want it to be between five and eight. No abnormalities with my urine. Moving on to FTA-ABS, which stands for fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption. Basically, it checks for the presence of antibodies resulting from the bacteria that causes syphilis, which, if you're unaware, is another STI. Now, I was shown as being reactive because I had been diagnosed and treated for syphilis in the past. This was years ago, I was treated, therefore I no longer have syphilis. However, it's one of those things where once you have it, you'll always have the antibodies present in your body, so you'll always have a reactive result on this test. So for me, it was reactive. It's showing the presence of those antibodies, even though I don't have syphilis. The next category, hemoglobin A1C. Basically that checks for your um, risk of diabetes. And mine was at 5.1. As long as it's under 5.7%, then um, you're good to go, no risk for diabetes. Between 5.7 and 6.4%, then you have an increased risk of diabetes and greater than or equal to 6.5% is consistent with someone who has diabetes. So all good there. And then we've got TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. That affects a lot of things like weight loss, weight gain, growth, a lot of things. That was at 1.21. The optimal range is between 0.4 and 4.5. And then, last but not least, the last two categories are the ones that I'm sure you guys have been waiting for and the most anxious to hear about in my lab results. We've got the first of the two, the lymphocyte subset panel five. Here we are with the percentage CD4. Mine was at 34%. The range that we want is between 30 and 61%. So it's on the lower range and it's been on the lower range, lower end of that range ever since my diagnosis. I'm, I'm not too sure that much about that number and what it means and if it's possible to raise it. And that might be something that I ask in a future doctor's appointment. But for now, all I know is that it's in the desired range, so I'm okay with it. And then my absolute CD4 count is 565. Uh, the desired range, again, for, between 490 and 1740. Now, for those of you who watched my recent video of the doctor's visit, uh, the doctor's assistant pointed out that for most people diagnosed with HIV, your CD4 count will rise about, on average, 300 more than when you were diagnosed. So I was diagnosed with 169 as my CD4 count. So the average rise 300 would take me up to 469. So that would be kind of the expected, even though the optimal range here is between 490 and 1740. If it's hovering around 469, it's to be expected because that's just the limitation of being diagnosed and how high it's gonna climb. So to know that mine's at 565, like I'm happy with that. I would love it to go higher. I know a lot of you guys 
your CD4 has, has risen well beyond that, but uh, mine tends to hover between the 400s and the most I've seen it was in the 800s and that was once and it dropped right back down. So there you go. And then the absolute lympho sites is at 1675 and the range would be between 850 and 3900, so well within the range. And last but not least, the HIV-1 RNA quantitative real-time PCR test. It was shown as being less than 20 copies, AKA undetectable. And then there's another one right below it. This is less than 1.3, also not detected or undetectable. And as a lot of you know, I've been undetectable for years at this point. I wanna say probably like four or five years I've been undetectable. I had one blip at that point and then I was undetectable before that as well. But yeah, so undetectable means untransmittable. There's zero risk of me transmitting the virus to someone else. I cannot infect anyone else with HIV while undetectable. That needs to be reiterated. So, and as you guys can see, my lab work has was, was really great. Aside from the glucose and the little bit of raised um, bad cholesterol that I had, which I'm wondering was skewed by me eating chocolate chip cookies right before my blood test. Aside from that, everything is spot on exactly where I want it to be. I don't have any weird side effects from the Bictarvi, so I can say now um, assuredly that Bictarvi is has been and is really, really, really great for me. I've had zero noticeable side effects, zero noticeable impact on my body based on the blood tests and the urinalysis. So it's a, it's a great, it's a really great all around medication. And also those of you that have concerns and ask me about uh, taking supplementation for bodybuilding, protein, creatine, as you can see, zero noticeable negative effects on my body based on the blood panel and the urinalysis. So I hope you guys found this useful. Um, I hope it was informative. Let me know if you have questions. Let me know if I got something totally wrong and you need to correct me in the comments below. Um, I'm always down to learn. Becca, I'm sure I'll hear uh, one or two or three things from you. <laughs> most likely pronunciation and probably a couple other things as well. But um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, I, I wanna keep doing this every six months, every time I go to the doctor and get my lab results for you so you can also see my journey uh, with that as well. All right guys, see you soon, peace.